Okay, well, thank you so much. And thank you to the really warm and wonderful uh, staff at the dorm. Um, and um, thank you to all of you for uh, joining us today to, to learn together. So we're gonna start with um, some of the fundamental science behind what is known in the field as a developmental neurobiological approach to psychotherapy. And so this slide uh, helps us see if you look at the brain from the left, that's a five-year-old brain, and towards the right is a 20-year-old brain. Uh, and what we're looking at is cortical thickness. And where it's blue, it shows that uh, the brain has matured in terms of cortical thickness. And where it's not blue, uh, there is still uh, work to be done in terms of brain maturation. It's important to uh, look at what areas are not yet mature because they're fundamental to what the developmental and maturational challenges are um, in young emerging adulthood. And those areas are on the left prefrontal cortex. Um, your, that's where your executive function and self-regulation of the limbic system, emotional uh, regulation occurs. And on the right uh, prefrontal cortex is where uh, unconscious self uh, experience and processing and especially the disturbances in that, such as dissociation and enactment where um, those networks reside. And then if you look at the top brain uh, all the way on the right, uh, you'll see that so much of the uh, parietal occipital junction is immature. This is where theory of mind resides as a functional networks, including things such as mentalization, mindfulness, uh, the ability to accurately process uh, faces and other kinds of um, nonverbal um, communications, please. So um, the, the challenge for all of us is to uh, think about um, both what we understand about self-development and what we understand about the brain and its maturation. And the challenge is to find and create treatment models that both heal wounded and support maturing brain systems. Thank you, please. So Yellow Brick has de developed a model that has four fundamental pillars to it. And going over that model is a, a talk for another day, but just to um, kind of walk us through it. So the first pillar of the model uh, is to reset the limbic system. And here we follow the research by Steve Porges which is known in the, as in the field as the polyvagal theory. Uh, there are two new books he's put out about the clinical application of the polyvagal theory, and I highly recommend them, please. Second is uh, to think of ways in which our interventions can increase cortical governance, uh, particularly over the limbic system, please. The third, and this is, I think, one of the greatest challenges uh, in treatment uh, overall is how to re-network motivational systems because uh, these are maturing at this time of life and often get kidnapped by um, uh, substance use and other types of compulsive behavior patterns. Uh, Sherry Turkle, who's a psychologist at MIT who studies the impact of um, technology on self-development, uh, worries that uh, there's a whole generation that uh, is seeking uh, moments of more, um, but finding they end up living lives of less. Um, please. So the last pillar is um, helping people to move towards secure attachment. And this is where we're gonna uh, focus today. The reason I love this particular picture to um, demonstrate secure attachment is because these are the most ferocious creatures on earth. And many young people, um, particularly growing up in today's culture, really associate secure attachment with weakness and um, with uh, inadequacy. And um, it seems to me these ferocious creatures really love secure attachment. You know? and so we have to help move our patients towards um, their finding the satisfactions that are more oxytocin mediated than uh, dopamine mediated, please. So why are secure attachments important? Well, there's a ton of research dating back to the Harlow monkey studies demonstrating that the brain does not grow outside 
of secure attachment. So if you look at the work of Schur and Siegel and Casalini and others, secure attachments are the requisite foundation for brain functioning, for brain maturation. This is really the neurobiological basis for why we are all doing psychotherapy and has particular implications for interpersonal and in-depth psychotherapy with people for whom the primary defensive organizations are um, linked with dissociation. Um, there's work um, from Panskep and Biven and Soames as well um, that shows that when the brain is deregulated, um, then the right brain, the unconscious brain, uh, the automatic default brain uh, patterns are the ones that are going to rule the day. Please. You're likely to be familiar with um, the ACEs study. Uh, the ACEs study demonstrates, this is where they followed people for now uh, 25 years and they continue to follow them. People who've had attachment trauma in early childhood and to the extent that you have an ACE score over four, um, you are likely to die 25 years earlier than people who um, have had secure attachment in childhood. You're 12 times more suicidal, seven times more likely to be depressed, five times more likely to be impulsive. Um, and they uh, are three times more likely to die from the seven leading causes of medical um, deaths. We understand this most likely related to chronic inflammation that then activates whatever the genetic neurobiological vulnerabilities are for these individuals. So trauma and attachment uh, has profound implications um, for um, our work, please. So as you know, there are many different psychotherapy models um, and they all uh, have benefit of different kinds and they all have their place. Um, we're gonna focus on um, the last one on this list, which is uh, known uh, as the neuropsychoanalytic approach to in-depth psychotherapy, please. So who is the kind of individual for whom this kind of uh, intervention uh, is required and who's eligible for it? It's really uh, for those people who've had educational, experiential, uh, supportive, skill-based types of psychotherapies, um, but they have not been able to achieve a uh, satisfactory uh, benefit from treatment. And that's due, in our view, to the unintegrated autonomy of what we um, pull from the literature, a, a term um, of core enactment. So these are um, enactment patterns in the unconscious right brain um, usually of a self-damaging nature that interfere with the ability to create what Winnicott calls a usable object. And these are the individuals who come to Yellow Brick, people who have not been able to benefit from uh, capable, supportive, educational, skill-based treatments. Half of the patients who come to Yellow Brick come from somewhere else across the country. Um, we kind of function as a Mayo Clinic for uh, emerging adults. Please. So the core enactment is about these structured, repeated self-damaging patterns. They're established in traumatic distress. We think of trauma um, as not um, actually, for the most part, including the single event trauma, um, but actually people for whom um, their um, routine life experience has had cumulative uh, experiences that have been overwhelming um, their brain capacity to, to metabolize it. These patterns are embedded in right brain subcortical uh, networks, um, the amygdala, the anterior cingulate. By definition, subcortical means they're not conscious. And so these, according to many, many authors, are um, the interpersonal manifestations of dissociated aspects of self-experience, which cannot be faced, okay? So enactments occur from an interpersonal context where dissociated parts of self-experience that are deeply troubling can't be recognized by the individual, but they become present in the relationship itself. 
please. So I'll give you an example of that, just a brief one. Um, so we recently worked with a, a young person who uh, was relentless in their uh, ex relationship with our staff, where we were inadequate, we were deficient, we were people who were morally corrupt. Um, and this person would take every opportunity to shame uh, one or more staff uh, in public settings, such as our community meeting, where twice a week we meet and people um, from all programs, all levels of care, all staff get together and talk about how we're doing as a community, what are our issues. And we felt shamed, we felt inadequate, we felt like we should, you know, quit and go sell shoes, you know. Um, and we understood our experience of being told that we are inadequate, worthless, never going to merit their approval, and that we were shamefully and morally uh, bankrupt as what this individual experienced as the uh, both explicit and implicit communications from um, their parents who were a very high profile, very highly successful family who um, had already really had their prodigy star um, in an older sibling. And this one was really just never going to make the cut. And, but, but she actually, from a conscious point of view, admired her parents, respected her parents, would defend her parents. Um, but um, this is how we understood the underlying communication from a dissociated part of self. So trauma results in dissociation. These are experiences that never enter consciousness. They're encoded both in relation patterns and they're encoded in the body. And Vander Kolk uh, speaks to how dissociation is at the center of these implicit, which again means unconscious, neural and psychic threat survival mechanisms. Soam speaks about how this kind of memory, relational, non-declarative memory and body memories, the way in which they um, um, make themselves known and present is through enactment. Please. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how do you recognize these core enactment self-states? Excuse me a second, please. So what we've come to recognize at Yellow Brick is that they can present in certain um, characteristic kinds of ways. Uh, one is just overwhelmed with distress and deregulation. Another is where shame and hypo arousal, shut downness, detachment from their own experience with behavioral avoidance. Another is um, where the person won't engage because they fear exposure of what they believe and perceive to be a bad, hated and unlovable self. Another is where they won't engage because they feel it would reactivate their trauma. And last, the last two represent where it's a kind of a breakdown, a demoralization breakdown of a sense of futility. Why bother to engage because of loss and abandonment? or they kind of are paralyzed um, in an existential separateness, aloneness experience where life has no meaning. Please. And these are the kinds of attachment patterns that uh, we see and try to help people begin to um, um, move through into different ways of relating. Um, one is what we known as an autoplastic self-regulation most typified by the restricting eating disorders. I have no needs, um, you know, um, and I don't need anyone uh, um, in relation to me. I can take care of it all myself. Uh, we see a fair number of twinning mergers. Coupling, I think, occurs on this basis. And it has a kind of paranoid structure where these special others, whether it's one or a small group, um, form a kind of us versus them type of disengagement and boundary. Uh, there are individuals who engage relentlessly in this kind of assaultive and provocative distancing. Others for whom 
Uh, avoidance occurs on the basis of a kind of, um, you know, ferocious, shameful uh, rage inside them. Then there are these individuals who um, relate in a way that force you to um, become a, a victimizer, that um, they create circumstances, particularly circumstances uh, where if you don't intervene, you're neglectful, but your intervention becomes an assault. Um, but you, they kind of tie your hands. We have patients, for example, who uh, will call 911 uh, when they're just massively deregulated and overstimulated and will act in a way when 911 comes that will force them to be put into restraints. Okay. Doesn't happen often, thank God, but it does happen. But that's a more extreme example of something that can happen in subtle ways along the way more frequently. And there are individuals whose pattern makes us as professionals just feel so helpless and so passive, you know, that uh, as if there's nothing for us that we can think about what to do. Please. So how do you recognize uh, a core enactment when it's in motion. And it's when you experience a disturbance in the force, that there's breakdowns in collaboration, or you know you're moving towards an impasse, or there's this kind of insoluble dilemma in the treatment that, you know, whichever way you turn, it's not a good choice, um, where all of a sudden you're um, faced with threats of termination of the treatment or self-harm uh, threats, where the patient um, becomes just so hurt, angry, and ashamed in ways that you, you know you didn't necessarily throw an elbow in their ribs, okay? Um, but something's happened on an unconscious level, um, where the patient breaks down into defeat, hopelessness, and shut down. Also times where you begin to have experiences inside you that you know are not typical for you. That something, some, some, you know, pilot light has been lit in you that is some kind of unconscious message from and communication from the patient. Please. So the, the technique um, in response to these um, involves what Shore calls trying to establish a limbic dialogue, which is about how to relate beyond the words. Um, and what Casolini calls becoming an amygdala whisperer. And here it's important to re remember some of your basic neurophysiology and neuroanatomy uh, because neural growth, which means new dendrites um, you know, appear, it requires defaulting, disrupting the default system. Okay, axons don't grow dendrites unless the default is disrupted. And what creates disruption? It's intensity, it's novelty and it's repetition of those intense and novel um, new experiences. Of course, disruption needs to occur in a uh, context that has a precondition for safety and trust that they're allowing you to disrupt them because they know you're safe. Um, and uh, the trauma literature, self-psychology, um, you know, um, and Winnicott, um, you know, emphasize that what is most important is not so much the disruption itself and even the degree of disruption, but it's the quality of the repair that promotes internalization and new uh, neural growth, which is what emotional and other kinds of learning really is at a cellular level. Please. So this is how we try to become a limbic whisperer, please. So what's required of us? We have to seize emotional arousal rather than back up or just try and calm it down. We have to create a context where patients are willing to be vulnerable and that we as therapists are willing to be fully present and available with distressing emotions that are the essence of the communication. It's an empathic immersion in an experience beyond the words. And we're paying attention to um, what's going on in the mind, mind brain, body uh, axis, because that's where the communication is coming from by definition 
in dissociation. And we're attuned to the rhythm and spirit of the relationship, not simply the words. Please. As therapists, we monitor our own distress. We monitor the things that we want to push away. Um, we want to pay attention, especially to the things that we're ignoring that are kind of elephants in the room, or they may just be kind of whispers in the corner. And that it's our responsibility and role to bring forward what is not being spoken, to take the experiential, which has no words, because it's not symbolic for the patient in their left brain, but we have a higher capacity, hopefully, to do that. We take those experiences and, in essence, we play with them by saying, you know, here's what's going on for me in this moment. And I experience this bind. If I do what I think is right here and what you need, I know you're going to feel violated. If I don't, I know you're going to feel neglected and abandoned. How do we get through that together? Rather than you have to solve that dilemma on your own. Okay. And so this requires a different approach to therapist disclosure, where the therapist is required to bring into the relationship your experience, not how you know that experience is related to your personal development, but in the moment, a reflective sharing of self states and beginning to wrestle together with what might this mean that we are in this together? Because it is the sharing and partnering of the dialogue and uh, the dyad that's where new learning and brain maturation occurs. Please. So this is a slide. Um, this is where we're gonna end. So this is about outcomes. So at Yellow Brick, we do um, quantitative EEGs. We do them at admission and we do them at transition. And this is a slide that's measuring what's known in the field as coherence. So quantitative EEG is a form of neuro neuroimaging that does electrical brain mapping. The red lines that you see on the four left, um, kind of brain heads, if you will, uh, each red line basically represents a traffic jam where a certain part, a network in the brain is not able to communicate effectively or requires too much power to be able to reach other networks that it needs to make some type of function happen. You know, so if you think about a memory, you know, a memory has a visual component, it has a hippocampal you know, or prefrontal cortex component, it has smell, it has words. You know, you're drawing on multiple parts of the brain in order to create that memory. So here we're showing that this particular individual upon admission uh, had a lot of trouble in the networking um, you know, capacity of their brain. And on the right side, the right four, uh, you see that this is a person who made um, actually a three standard deviation uh, progress um, in their treatment. Okay, demonstrating that this type of approach um, can change the way in which people's brains operates. Please. Final slide uh, showing a different aspect of a quantitative EEG. These are Loretta slides. So the red means that the person's deregulation, and this shows the anterior cingulate, which again is the kind of the regulator for the limbic system, um, that the anterior cingulate in this person is more deregulated than 99.3% of the population upon admission and upon their transition out of yellow brick, please. You can see that this person um, was able to um, not only in ways that are more traditional, but on some on a neuroimaging uh, technology that one cannot fake, um, that uh, you can see the kind of progress that's been made by the use of this uh, type of psychotherapy approach within a wider context of many other kinds of um, uh, interventions. So as I end, I like to say that um, when Ed Kansian was um, uh, retiring after 50 years as the director of the substance abuse program at um, Mass General Harvard uh, Hospital. And he was asked, so what really makes a difference in terms of outcome and treatment? 
Uh, I love what he said uh, in this NPR interview. He said, show up and don't give up. So in addition to all the fancy footwork that we keep you know, trying to learn to expand our you know, talents and expertise, uh, show up and don't give up because our patients need us. Thank you so much for your interest and attention. And now we'll move on to how enactment um, has relevance for um, the enterprise of coaching. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Viner. This, um, it's funny, when, when we decided on doing this topic, um, I, this is the kind of stuff that really excites me to talk about. I, you know, I did analytic training and I feel like I'm an analyst at heart who doesn't always get to use the analytic training that, that I did, but these, these concepts are just, um, fascinating to talk about, to think about, and then to also experience in, um, in a therapeutic dyad with, um, with the patient. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about coaching, because we often think about these more, um, some of these concepts that Dr. Viner talked about in um, more conventional therapeutic um, dyads or settings. And what we're learning, um, at least, um, you know, our staff is learning at the, at the dorm is that um, coaching and our coaches are all licensed clinicians in some way um, creates an even more ripe environment for some of these really complex phenomenon to, um, to come to life and to come to life in a very intense um, manner. When, when we think about psychotherapy um, versus coaching, psychotherapy really you know, seeks to facilitate emotional healing by examining uh, past experiences and patterns and events. Uh, we're looking at transference, it's very relationship focused, um, an unfolding of processes through which healing and growth can occur. And most importantly, when we think about therapy, we think about a room with four walls and a couch and a chair um, that are set up in a variety of different ways. Coaching, on the other hand, um, looks really different. Coaching doesn't necessarily take place in that conventional four-walled room. And in fact, oftentimes it doesn't. Coaching can take place in a client's apartment. Um, coaching can take place on a sidewalk in New York City as you're walking down the street um, approaching the subway where you're going to do an exposure because the client, you know, has difficulty with public transportation, or it can be approaching a restaurant that a client wants to give their resume to. So coaching happens anywhere and, and everywhere on a basketball court. I mean, there's just so many places where coaching um, and, and clinical coaching happens. Coaching tends to be much more action oriented, solution focused versus process focused. Um, and it's very focused on the here and now, um, centered on goals, objectives, accountability. Um, you know, a coach can be the accountability partner, uh, cheerleader, motivator from the client's perspective, nag. <laughs> I mean, it's all about perspective and how you view it, but um, you know, uh, there is a substantial difference when a therapist is playing a therapist role versus a coach role with a client. And, you know, as I stated before, you know, it's what we're finding often during coaching outside of that conventional four walled room and that more standard therapeutic frame when clients might have their most um, intense therapeutic moments, whether that's because they're, maybe their guards are down because they're not in that four walled room or because um, the interpersonal dynamics uh, are ripe for causing some of those more intense reactions um, or a combination of both. What we know is that we're seeing um, a lot of those moments happening in, in the coaching dynamic. Uh, working on skills, especially when there's some pretty substantial skills deficits can be really emotionally um, draining. It can be interpersonally overwhelming and it can trigger a whole slew of complex psychic uh, 
processes, uh, both internal and, and interpersonal. So in thinking about sort of the ones that we see, like these, these very interesting phenomenon that we see happen um, in, in a coaching dynamic, um, I wanted to call out a couple and just sort of focus in on them and talk about them. Um, and I'm gonna start with something positive. <laughs> um, and that is this concept that we call a corrective emotional experience. Um, textbook definition, basically, you know, it's when the therapeutic action or the therapeutic relationship provides a client with an experience that is quote unquote corrective. And in contrast to what clients have come to expect or have experienced in other um, you know, primary relationships in their, in their lives. Um, and, you know, this is really rooted in an experiential um, format when uh, a coach and a therapist can be working on these really difficult um, goals and objectives with one another and do so in a manner that is very different than experiences that they've had maybe working on, um, let's say the client has an executive function issue um, and their father was always the one to help them with their homework and it was very punitive and very shaming um, and very wrapped in just anxiety. And if the coach can do so with them in a manner that feels very safe and supportive, um, that is a corrective emotional experience that a, that also provides um, a framework within a client where they might learn that they no longer have to expect or anticipate the same problematic responses from other people in their life because they've had this corrective emotional experience. Maybe they're not scared to go to the student um, counseling center to get a tutor to help them with um, some issues they're having in their history class because their relationship with their coach and their coach helping them with some of their executive function issues has provided a corrective framework and it's no longer so deeply tied to the experience they had with their parent growing up. So this can be a huge choice, a huge source of therapeutic change for the client and can pave the way for so many more satisfying um, relationships in, in their lives. I just gave a case example. I'm gonna wrap some of them up as I am um, talking about it. Um, Cause I think the case examples really bring sort of these concepts that can feel very sort of cerebral um, more, more to life. Uh, another sort of concept that we learn a lot about um, both, you know, if you do analytic training or in school is this notion of a transitional object. And this commonly refers to physical objects that are used in early childhood, like a blanket or a stuffed animal, or that is an extension of a young child's primary caregiver. And it's used to provide psychological comfort um, do, during new or unique situations or when a parent um, isn't present. I remember um, when I was babysitting um, while I was getting my master's degree and the parents kind of just like, they were mm -hmm. so happy when I arrived, they handed me the baby and they just got out and I put the baby to sleep and the baby was just, there was no consoling this baby. Like this baby was just crying and I had no idea what to do. And I was trying to hold the baby, rock the baby, feed the baby, nothing that I was doing was working. And I remembered reading about, you know, transitional objects in a class and I started like scout, like just going through the mom's laundry. And I found a shirt of hers that just like smelled like her. And I threw it in the crib. I'm like, please make this work. And it did. The baby eventually like stopped crying a little bit. So transitional objects can certainly be um, pretty powerful tools for, um, for children and can help defend against, you know, uh, anxiety, depressive anxiety, 
in adults, um, we also can create transitional objects. Um, you know, they can be in the form of sacred keepsakes, like items that pull us back to positive and safe memories and promote connection um, and attachment and identification. Like if you're having a bad day and maybe you look through an old photo album that, you know, brings you back to a more um, happy, serene time. Um, but physical objects might not be required um, and to be transitional objects. So for instance, and this happens both in, in therapy and in coaching, where um, the, the helping professional might say like, you know, you're not alone, you can take me with you and what we have learned together with you, the skills that we are working on together, um, are, they're, they're with you. I am with you when I'm not with you. Uh, and what's interesting, what we're finding is that this phrase can take on a lot more meaning for clients um, when uh, in the coaching dynamic, because oftentimes the coaches are in the client's spaces outside of the treatment setting, right? We are in their apartments. We are helping them to organize their rooms and put their sleep, you know, hygiene checklist on their bulletin boards and helping them to do dishes. So we have actually been in their spaces. So it's easier in a sense for them to imagine us being there when we're not there because we have been there. Um, and, and, and the coach and the coach can sort of serve as this powerful um, transitional object. And I think in a way that's almost easier than, than, than the therapist can. So that's been fascinating to watch unfold. And I gave you my case examples. Uh, enactments, and Dr. Viner certainly spoke about this, so I won't go into this in great detail, other than to say that some of the enactments we see unfolding in the coaching dynamic can get pretty um, intense. Again, because we are in very personal spaces outside of the typical therapeutic frame, which tends to provide a little bit more of a, of a buffer, but enactments are these sort of patterns of nonverbal interactional behavior between two parties because uh, it's not just the client that brings their stuff to the relationship. We all have stuff. I'll speak for myself. I have stuff and I know I bring stuff to dynamics um, and dyads as well. Um, and it is the interplay um, and the mutual projective identification that can really create these pretty complicated, um, intense, powerful um, enactments. And while they're commonly initiated or created by a patient, um, you know, we as therapists are human beings and, and we can certainly be reactive if we're not able to sort of process counter transferentially what may be um, going on. But often the patient is recreating the same type of conflictual relationship patterns um, from their past, um, usually from childhood with the therapist. Um, in a coaching dynamic, again, you know, because we're so often in apartments or helping with these concrete um, skills, it can be very, very, very easy um, for patients to um, initiate some of these old, um, very loaded, very emotional, um, conflictual dynamics uh, with us. I remember that um, I was working with a client and um, it was like every single time I spoke and I, and I know that I don't tend to be somebody who raises my voice a lot. I'm just, I'm not a yeller. I, I wish I, I was, I'm not, I don't scream. I don't yell. Um, I do get angry, but it expresses itself in, in different ways, probably much more passive. Um, but literally every time um, I spoke and it was typically around asking him to do something that he hadn't done that I needed to sort of hold him accountable to doing, he would break down and start crying and say, stop yelling at me, stop yelling at me. And he truly was experiencing me as yelling at him, but I, I, I really, I really wasn't. Um, 
And then that sort of accusation of, um, and that experience of him saying that I was yelling at him in turn, you know, brought up some of my own stuff and, and, and got me into a place where I just wanted to automatically like be like caretaker, do everything for him, make everything better, which was also a different dynamic he experienced with a different parent. His mother was a yeller, yelled at him for everything. And his father was the person who always wanted to like fix and pacify and do everything for him. So mom didn't start to yell at him. So I felt like I was like straddling these two separate roles, but um, these old patterns were created. And, you know, I think that um, it can be very easy to fall into this repetition compulsion where we're like really uh, sort of engaging in the enactment and allowing it to continue versus being able to sort of step back and say, okay, let's see what's really happening here. Let's, let's talk about this. Um, and, and when you are, and when you're able to work through it, like Dr. Viner said, that's where there's the potential. It is through the repair that there is the potential for such growth and a corrective emotional experience. You can go to the next slide, thanks. Um, the last one that I'm gonna talk about, cause I really wanna leave time for, um, for questions is um, projective identification. Uh, projective identification is, is a defense mechanism in which the individual, the client projects qualities that tend to be unacceptable to themselves onto the therapist. The therapist then internalizes those projected qualities and believes them, um, believes themselves to be characterized by them almost. Um, so you're taking on the feelings that the client doesn't want to be experiencing. So for example, um, if I have a client and this has happened to me a lot who um, <sighs> struggles with some, um, let's say intense feelings of um, anxiety, uh, and these feelings are, are very hard for the client to express, very unacceptable to themselves. So they project those feelings onto me. And as a result, every time I enter a session with that client, a coaching session, like before I have to go in that apartment or meet them on the street to do job interview stuff, I'm, I feel anxious and feel anxious in a way that I don't normally feel anxiety. So I know it's not my stuff. Um, I, 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 there's something that is going on with the client that they are making me feel the anxiety that they don't want to feel, that they don't necessarily know how to express that they're feeling. So instead of telling me that they're feeling anxious, they're making me feel the feeling that they don't want to feel. Which also, again, can be a huge opportunity for um, for growth and connection within the dynamic, because if I am able to identify that feeling that's happening in me and know it's not my counter transference because I've explored that, but likely a projective identification, that allows me to say to the client, you know, I'm wondering if you're feeling anxious right now. Um, I, I'm, I'm feeling a sense of like anxiety in this, you know, relationship or in this dyad right now in, in our space. And it opens up the possibility to talk about that, which feels untalkable or undiscussable with, with the client. With that, I've said a whole mouthful. Um, and I want to turn things over to give time for discussion and questions and comments. Thank you so much to both of you, Dr. Viner and, and Amanda. It's It's been a really rich overview and I feel the same way, Amanda. I felt like I just wanted to keep going and going and going because I, I was being reminded of concepts that I don't always think about all the time. So it was really fun to listen to y'all talk. Um, we have about 10 minutes now, so I wanna make sure we get to some questions. So um, I know Tracy put a question in from Elle Miller um, just about the question for uh, maybe Amanda, but also Dr. Viner too, about, you know, thinking about a young adult wh who might be highly anxious and we have weak executive functioning, would they benefit from simultaneously working with both the a psychotherapist and a coach? Um, or 
would it be better to work with one and then the other uh, and not at the same time? So I think that's a really interesting uh, question, especially given these enactments that can happen both in psychotherapy and in coaching like you all have been talking about. Amanda, do you wanna to speak to that? I mean, I think the answer is it, it depends. <laughs> um, I think absolutely it can be hugely beneficial for the person to work both with a therapist and a coach at the same time and have the experience of being within more of a, um, you know, conventional therapeutic frame in the therapy room with a therapist while also working more on the concrete um, skills with a coach. The caveat would be that it's like uber important. It's kind of like non-negotiable that the coach and the therapist need to really be communicating and talking a lot. Um, and comparing notes um, because if the same sort of enact, are the same enactments occurring? Um, uh, is there a similar sort of uh, counter transferential response going on between therapist and coach? It's just, it's important that that everybody's on, on the same page. And we also don't wanna, you know, overwhelm the client either. Did you wanna speak to that Dr. Viner too? Thank you. I, I support all that Amanda said. At Yellow Brick, we um, experience a really powerful leverage in doing what I think is um, being proposed by um, the question in that um, we believe in real-time treatment, that we want people to uh, challenge themselves to engage in all those uh, areas that um, you know create discomfort, create anxiety, uh, are at the kind of the outer border of their, um, you know, comfort zone, uh, all within a supportive context, because we believe that by doing so, you're going to not only uh, build from the outside in, in terms of skill development and strengthening uh, learning in that sense, but it's going to activate uh, the vulnerabilities that um, you know, then can be understood from within the psychotherapeutic context. So we very much have seen the power of this kind of hand and glove synergy of what coaching would provide. For example, we employ occupational therapists, uh, exposure uh, response prevention, I think is within this, you know, principle um, where um, there, there's this uh, powerful synergy between um, both approaches inside out and outside in. Thank you for that. Uh, what was also coming to my mind just from a provider end of things is some of these cases and these patients can be pretty tough and we're experiencing the emotions that you both were speaking to in these kinds of dynamics. And so I always appreciate a buddy <laughs> or a team to be able to, to collaborate with people and, and, and think through what's me what's maybe happening with the client? What do we have in common? What, what, you know, what are both providers experiencing that there's an intersection and that can help me sort through some of my own personal reactions versus some of the things that are more of an enactment. So thank you for that. Other questions that anyone has, um, you're welcome to put something in the chat, turn off your mic or turn on your microphone and chime in. I, I wrote down three words that you said, Dr. Viner about, Viner, about the intensity, novelty, and reinforcement, and that that's and then, and also the disruption of those patterns is where brain learning happens, and and it made me think about, you know, just those systems that a lot of our clients are engaged with that really are designed to speak to intensity, novelty, and reinforcement, like video games, pornography substance use um, and how, you know, how that plays into it when we're kind of competing with those types of reinforcements um, at times when we're working with young adults. It, not really a question, but just kind of an observation. Any, any thoughts or things that you wanted to kind of touch on about that? Oh, well, this is why I, you know, when I was going over the foundation pillars of our model, the re-networking of motivation is why I said this is one of our most significant challenges, the re-networking of motivation. Um, you know, you'll remember the phrase, which comes actually from the 40s, um, you know, what fires together, wires together. Um, and so these systems 
uh, reamplify themselves and um, our brains respond preferential, preferentially to uh, the acceleration of intensity, okay? Um, and so, you know, we have a bias to move towards that. And so the more kind of quiet satisfactions of adult life, mm. um, you know, I, I, one of the things, you know, I say when I talk about this in more depth is when you take a hit of meth, you, you introduce 10,000 molecules of dopamine. Um, when you finish your homework, one. That's what we're up against here, you know? Um, and so how to move people towards uh, experiences of authenticity, of competence, um, you know, of connectedness. It, this is where the challenge is. Um, and uh, it is not easy. And, and I, I've, I've actually asked, um, you know, the, inter the top international clinician scholars about how we should approach this. And they all say to me, I know who you should talk to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not them. <laughs> they don't have the answer either. You know, but um, I do think an immersion in connectedness is, um, is part of the flow away from these overstimulating, uh, you know, moments. Yeah. And I, I think about expectation management too, just telling a patient, listen, this is not going to feel the same as that hit of math. So it's gonna be more subtle, but if you pay attention, you can train your brain to start to feel it, that the bird song starts to feel just as pleasurable as something else, but it takes a little practice and paying attention, which is also another challenge. That's a really important point because mindfulness training is um, another fundamental intervention that we employ throughout everything else we're doing. Every group starts with mindfulness training. Every individual session starts with mindfulness training and ends with it as well. And so, because unless, you know, you pay attention in the moment to, like you say, the bird song, I love that expression, um, you actually feel empty. And it's that emptiness which drives you, you know, towards the high stimulus event and experience. Thank you. I, I know we only have four minutes according to my clock before the four o'clock hour. Just quick, I wanted to highlight two, two things. Um, you know, a, a, another question about what are the signs that you all look for in when somebody's ready to live outside of a therapeutic environment? So maybe one minute, uh, Amanda or, or, or Dr. Viner on, on some of those signs. And I also wanted to highlight before people pop off um, uh, Tom Mizell's contact information for more information about um, about Yellow Brick too. So if there's any other questions that you want to talk about, feel free to reach out to, to Tom. So you wanted one, one minute on, on that quick note about how is somebody ready to live outside of a therapeutic environment? Amanda, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think that, <laughs> you know, it, it, it obviously every, every individual is, is unique and different and starts the process in, in a different place. Um, but what we do know is that um, healing takes time um, and we wanna set people up for um, success yet also put them in the least restrictive environment as, as is possible. Um, so, you know, I think it's looking for, you know, A, you know, you know, what symptomatically are they, are they stable? Are they a danger to themselves? Are they a danger to others? Um, you know, where are their symptoms at in terms of, you know, severity? If somebody is using substances, if somebody is uh, diagnosed with depression or an eating disorder, you know, what's going on symptomatically. And then also, you know, the state of their relationships, their ability to connect interpersonally and also just their overall um, level of insight and motivation. Many of our clients, and I think this is, you know, Yellow Brick is, is sort of like more of a, is, is, is a starting point. And then they end up transitioning more to, um, to outpatient and aftercare. And, and I, 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 I see, you know, the ability to live on one's own is also tied to how strong an aftercare plan is and what supports they have um, in place to maintain the gains and that they've made leading up 
to that, but safety is first and foremost, and then sustainability. We don't just want somebody to go and live on their own outside of treatment. We want them to sustain that and not be in that revolving door of being in and out, in and out of treatment. Thank you. Well, I'm noticing we're, the... sorry, go ahead. I'll be quick. <laughs> yeah. uh, so again, I, I uh, uh, support what Amanda said, but I would also add that what we focus on, particularly from the transition from the residential level of care to going back to an apartment or a campus, is the ability to self-regulate, not such that they have to be asymptomatic, but that self-harm acts um, do not create life safety circumstances or don't potentially disrupt um, the, the flow of you know, continued development, and that they're willing um, and capable of act, initiating uh, access to support, that they have it within them to be able to, to, to reach out and that they're willing to take supported risks um, or else they're gonna get kind of developmentally arrested once again. Thank you, really important to add. So thank you so much for that. So I'm mindful of the time, so we'll have to leave it there. There's another question that we can follow up uh, on in a follow-up email that you'll all be getting uh, with our contact information and of course the contact information of folks at Yellow Brick. So. Uh, next week, we'll be here at three o'clock on Thursday, Eastern time, um, talking about anti-racism and, and mental health uh, and really thinking about a time of reckoning, reckoning and, and uh, action that needs to be taken in our field. We'll be joined by um, Adriana Westby Trent, who's the executive uh, clinical director of PCH Center. So we will see you all hopefully next week.